All right, Tommy, this is the podcast I've been dying for because this is the podcast where we share our experiences with, well, each other and you guys. And we're talking about the best and worst off-roaders that we have actually owned. And we've owned probably way too many of them. And we're going to go down the list, right? Yeah, that's right. So we've had a great privilege to operate a lot of different types of vehicles from all around the world in various off-road terrain, from rocks to mud to sand, um, all up in the Rocky Mountains through Moab. And these are the most reliable ones, the best ones we liked, and the ones we might avoid. Yeah, and keep in mind, guys, we have actually spent our own money on these. So while we get to test a lot of different off-roaders that belong to the manufacturers, these are the ones that we've bought. Uh, And we're going to go with first... The vehicles that are, well, the most car-like, but because, well, we do another podcast called Talking Trucks, we usually don't include trucks in this podcast, but we will today, at the end of this list, we're going to talk about the best trucks that we've owned. So let's just get right to it, Tommy. Sit back and relax, or keep driving if you're driving. TFL Talking Cars is on the air, the world's most popular car podcast. Okay, maybe not yet, but we're working on it. Uh, how are we st- what are we starting with? What vehicle? The oldest first? Yeah, we can do the really old stuff first. That's okay. fine. Um, so typically what we do is we buy these vehicles for not a huge amount of money. We're not looking for the best examples. And we own them for about a year to two years and really put them through their paces, figure out what's good about them uh, and what's bad about them. And let's start with the oldest one we've had the privilege to own. Yes. 1961 International Harvester Scout. Wow, that's like the original crossover slash SUV slash off-roader, even before the Bronco. Uh, We call this guy lucky because we found him in a barn up in Wyoming. Uh, We went and pulled him out, uh, and he was covered in mouse poo, uh, and then we brought him (laughs) down here, uh, and then we did a video series around him called Getting Lucky because we did. I mean, an international scout, especially the first one, is very rare, uh, and this one was um, interesting. Well, to your point, what International did is they took the formula of the Willys G which is a very rudimentary four-wheel drive vehicle and tried to civilize it a little bit. So they gave it real doors and a real top and stuff like that. But it was not quite civilized enough. So the really early ones, like the one we had, a 1961 Scout 80, it was it was largely a street-legal tractor. Three-speed manual, a tiny four-cylinder engine, 152 cubic inches, but a very solid off-roader. Yeah, it had a lot of levers on it. <laughs> <laughs> that allowed you to do a lot of different things. So one of the coolest things about it, it added a PTO, right, a power takeoff. Oh, yeah, a winch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was actually hooked up to a winch, but it could have been hooked up as easily to, I don't know, you know, a chainsaw or... or an auger. An auger, yeah. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of levers in it. Um, it was like getting back in 1961, uh, but the suspension was beyond bad. Yeah, and we didn't actually spend a lot of time uh, driving this one around just because it was so rudimentary, and it takes a lot of effort to get those to the trail. But the next one we're going to talk about, we did have a lot of experience off-road with. So Ford, in 1966, took the success of the International Scout. And copied it. (laughs) Yes, and totally ripped it off in the uh, Bronco. So we had a 68 Bronco half cab. What's a half cab? Half cabs is a little tiny pickup truck. They made them in three flavors: half cab, uh, roadster, which was basically a topless, a yeah, <laughs> yeah, bronco, and then of course the one that you guys are familiar yeah, the with, the wagon, the wagon, which was the one that everybody knows. Uh, we found it up uh, in Canyon City, where all the uh, prisons are in Colorado. It belonged to a prison guard actually, and he had used it as a. Uh, plow truck, uh, and it was pretty much original, uh, and it had the 289 yeah. under the hood, which was a V8. They also came in a V6, uh, and it had, what was it, three on the tree? It was a manual transmission with three speeds on the tree, and we did take it off-road. Yeah, so unlike the Scout, the Bronco was actually pretty quick. So the, the Scout was woefully slow, but the original first-gen Broncos are so small and stubby and lightweight that when you put a 289 in front of them, you know, they haul butts. And the great thing about the Broncos is rather than a lot of the other four-wheel drives of the era, they had coil springs. So they rode really, really well. So off-road, the ride was amazing. We took it up our uh, Cliffhanger 1.0. Do you remember that in the yeah. pouring rain? Yep. Low range, first gear, pop the clutch, and the thing is very good. Yeah, it was pretty much unstoppable. It had these little tiny, uh, very narrow wheels and tires. Uh, and, uh, you know... I mean, people love Broncos, and the nice thing about our first generation is that it was uncut, right? A lot of them got 
in order to get lifted, they cut the wheel well so they could put bigger tires underneath. Ours was original, uh, and it was unmolested. And we were going to do that. We were actually going to do what everybody else does and lift it as a part of the project. And when we put out the first video, they were like, you can't touch the – you guys were like, you can't touch that Bronco. It's too original. It's too cool. Uh, so we took it off, wrote a bunch, and then ended up selling it to a museum. Is it um, comparable to a modern vehicle? No. I mean, it's still – you know, the brakes aren't great. Uh, yeah, the, it had four-wheel drums, ours. Yeah. Um, yeah. But off-road, they work really well, and they are comfy. So unlike a lot of the 60s and 70s off-roaders, the Broncos are nice and squishy. Yeah. But is, is, it, is it like you know the dream that you see in the Viagra commercial? No, it's not, it's not that good. It's, it's still a, you know, a basic rudimentary truck that is like half truck and half tractor when it comes to its actual performance on the road. So the next vehicle we're going to talk about was a truck I owned, actually. Yep. Um, and it's in here because it was old. <laughs> yes. It was a 74 F-250. Uh, we called it Rusty Boy. Um, I bought it because it had an engine rebuild, allegedly. Well, because it was a high boy. You bought it because it was a high boy. Yeah, but specifically this one, because I, I looked past the rust. Owner said it had an engine rebuild. And then like a week into ownership, it started dropping lifters. Um, so it definitely needed an- another rebuild. But even in its very poor condition... The thing was pretty incredible. So what they did with the high boy was uh, they divorced the transmission and the transfer case. So the transfer case was right in the center of the vehicle, which allowed equal length drive shaft front and rear, which led to the first monster truck. Yeah, Bigfoot. Uh, and when you have equal drive shafts, right, you can lift the vehicle without uh, changing the angle of the, the, the drive shaft too much. And well, that's why it became the, the Bigfoot originally. And it was cool. It's just a cool looking truck. And unlike the previous two, uh, it was actually very livable. You could actually drive it. Yeah. It, wa- it wasn't uh, as um, rudimentary as the other two that we have talked about. The, the thing that always terrified me about it was that the fuel tank was right behind the seat. Yeah, so the high boys actually had different frames from the rear wheel drive F-250s. Yeah. So they had to put the fuel tank inside the cab because it didn't fit between the frame rails but we took it up cliffhanger 2.0 a very difficult hill climb yep. compared it against the raptor and it did amazing not sophisticated in any way a carburetor and a 360 you know floor it basically all the way up the hill uh, the battery flew out of it if you remember i remember the battery it didn't fly out of it it f- flew into the engine bay right it was next to the engine bay and ended up in the engine bay yeah well it flew out of it basically <laughs> just inches from flying out of the ground uh, but love that truck uh, probably should have put some money into rebuilding it, but the bodies just rust so fast. Um, and yeah, and, and the one thing all three of these have in common is their suspension was very rudimentary, right? Leaf springs. Uh, yeah, but the Broncos were different. The Broncos had coils. Yeah. You know, the, the High Boy was definitely leaf, leaf sprung. It was pretty uncomfortable. But you can put a huge tire on the High Boys without lifting them because they were so high from the but, factory. But this is, like I say, the suspension, even if it's coils, or is very rudimentary. So when you get it off-road, uh, they just... Uh, beat you up a lot. The reason that the high boy didn't beat you up a lot was because the thing was so long, right, that it had a smoother ride. It had tall tires so you could air down as opposed to the Bronco or the Scout, which were these short little wheelbase things that you hit one bump and the second later you're over it again. And it, it just boom, boom. And you're like, oh my God. Okay, so next up on our list was probably one of our most popular vehicles we did. Yeah. Also pretty old. Um, Samurai. So ni- mid talk about a short wheelbase, huh? Yeah, mid nineteen eighty samurai. You almost jumped out of that thing. It almost popped you. Oh, was it the videographer? I think you were taking it up. Was it uh, Pennsylvania Gulch? <laughs> yeah. And you almost popped uh, Matt out the top of it. It, it. it was so bouncy. Samurai, very small, very lightweight, solid axles. Um, talk about rudimentary suspension. But the great thing about them is because they're so small and narrow, it's basically like driving a trials bike. It's the automotive equivalent of a trials bike. Um, so we took it up this trail that was way too hard for a bone stock Samurai, and it still did it. It still did it. It was that good off-road. However, it was the single worst off-road experience of my life was in that vehicle. I had to drive it like four miles down a um, like a bumpy forest road. What a disaster. What a uncomfortable... It was basically the automotive equivalent of constantly getting a colonoscopy. Uh, you know, I, I owned the Samurai when it, they were new. Uh, and back then, I had to sell it because I was doing uh, some stupid you know lifting and I hurt my back and I couldn't... Uh, drive it around anymore. That's how bad the ride was. Now you multiply that times 10 when you take it off road. So, you know, I've kind of done a lot of whining and bitching about uh, how bad the ride is, but all these no. vehicles are way cool, right? When, when, when you're in them and the weather is 
beautiful uh, and the sun is shining and you're just cruising down the road, you've got the only samurai or high boy or scout, you know, within 200 miles. Uh, and that's what makes them really fun. It's, it's kind of how unusual and rare they are. And they're very um, interesting because they have a lot of character, right? They're not bland. I mean, today's, if you look at, if you look at a Santa Fe today and you compare it, let's say, to a Escape and uh, you compare it to a RAV4 from the back, they all look the same, right? There's no, there's no doubt that when you're in a Samurai or a High Boy or a Bronco that you're the only guy on the road with that kind of a vehicle. Yeah, I love the Samurai. It's just... I mean, I don't want to bitch about the ride, but it was a horrible ride off-road. Yeah, Really we, bad. And we should jump to one of the trucks because we did do that video comparing it to the Comanche that we just sold, right? Yeah, so we had a... Um, oh, yeah, we just sold that yesterday. 1988 Jeep Comanche. Yeah. Short bed, four-wheel drive, four-liter manual transmission. Super underrated truck. Yep. Basically, they took the front half of an XJ, mated it with the frame, put a bed on it, called it a Comanche. Yep. Built to compete with, like, the and, Ranger. And if you don't know what an XJ is, it's a Wrangler, basically. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Cherokee. Yeah, Cherokee. Cherokee. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, Cherokee. yeah. yeah. Um, but um, built to compete with, like, the Ranger, the S10. Um, but the Comanches are powerful. They were very powerful for the era with the 4-liter straight 6. Um, that was – I just – we sold it yesterday. It was probably the hardest vehicle we've ever sold. So, you know, I like to say we're not in the car collecting business. So we buy the vehicle, we do the video series, and then we sell it. That one hurt, you know. And it's been sitting at the office for about a year, and we hadn't been doing much with it. Mark Allen, the head designer for Jeep, uh, wanted to buy it, and then for personal reasons he didn't. So it was uh, it was a sad day to see it go. Uh, but, um, you know, it's time to move on to bigger and better and another off-roader. So let's keep going down the list, dude. Uh, 85 Chevy K10, big green. Yes. Um, this was a full-size long bed truck. Yep. We bought with a 305, swapped the 350 into it. Yep. Uh, the tires were too big for it. <laughs> if we're being honest, we were running in 35s. It never was quite sorted off-road, and then we never quite got, quite got the engine sorted. Um, but Steve has been working on it up in Canada. He owns it now. Yeah. I love that truck. If you want an old-school, square-body Chevys are awesome vehicles. I uh, can't recommend them enough. Between the square-body and the um, high boy, I'd probably take the square-body just because it's a little bit newer. And even with that 305, which is a boat anchor, can't recommend that the the square bodies enough. Yeah, the square bodies are great, especially if you get rid of those uh, leaf springs that, that come with it. Uh, there there are companies that sell better off road setups for it than that, uh, but the leaf springs are, are pretty hard off road. They beat you up again, but it, because it's such a big truck, it doesn't matter as much. And you could put big old tires on it that you can air down and make comfortable. Our ours was a what a three speed manual? No, it was a um, it four that, speed with a granny low. Yeah, with mm-hmm. a granny low, and that granny low was really useful. Off-road. Yeah, that's a thing that is no longer a prevalent in, in new trucks. Yeah, but a super low ratio first gear. Yeah needs to come back because yeah. with that even with a low amount of power and big tires it would crawl over a lot it would crawl over a lot okay so next up on our list yep. we're going to transition into off-road suvs okay. so full-sized um, vehicles that will carry your family to the most remote places so the first one we bought was um an 04 discovery land rover discovery 2 i remember uh, buying this uh, you refused to buy a discovery 2 because our neighbor had one and it was terrible uh, and we finally bought this one lifted, a um, couple inch lift, a little bit bigger tire, snorkel, um, sorry, bumper on it, roof rack. And this was probably one of my all time favorite SUVs we've ever owned. You know, we expected it to be an absolute garbage pile, but we put nine, ten thousand 10,000 miles on it. The thing ran like a top the entire time. It leaked oil, but it, it took me and my friends to some really remote places. Yeah, we bought it because uh, somebody had put a lot of time, effort, and love into it. So it was really done upright, right? It had the ARV front bumper. Uh, it had the side steps slash rock rails. Uh, it had uh, a winch, a worn winch. It had a very uh, expensive and capable um, pump in the back that you can use to um, reflate tires. Mm-hmm. Um, it had the Baja roof rack on it. I mean, it was the stuff on it was almost worth more than the truck itself. And it, of course, it had the standard set of Disco 2 problems, the three Amigos, uh, you know, the head gasket. Head gasket. Uh, I don't want to go down the list. It's just too long. Uh, a lot of character. The biggest problem that, I, that bugged me about it was when somebody had actually gone and, you know, put all this like extra stuff on it, they took apart the dashboard and the dashboard was never quite put together. So you could actually take like the, the binnacle and move it. Or um, the other problem that was very common with them is that the uh, headliner starts to droop on them. And I just have a pet peeve about droopy headliners. It just, yep. it just bugs me. But, yeah, you 
you're right. It was a it was a magical, wonderful vehicle, uh, and um, I, I'm not sure if we got lucky or if we were smart or if um, you know if that was a typical buying experience. Yeah, and the thing too is. You know, we brought it to our Land Rover shop. They yeah. said it needed eight grand of repairs. Yeah. We did none of them. Yeah. And Except for one. We fixed the lock on the back. That was broken. Yeah, and the rear brakes, yeah. too. Um, but other than that, we didn't do the head gaskets. We didn't do the front drive shaft. You know, we just left it as we bought it, ran like a top, sold it, was still running like a top. We did have to keep putting oil into the rear diff, right? Yeah, but we fixed that. Remember? That no, was we like kept leaking. Bucks. We kept putting more. Yeah, I, I know. And then um, we resealed it. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. Loved that truck. Great off-road ride, even with solid axles. So we replaced that with the 2006 LR3. I was really sad when that happened. Um, and I loved the LR3 just as much, if not more, than the Discovery 2. Because yeah. single best ride of the entire list. Yeah, if you want, you know, for me, uh, with a bad back, as I uh, go off-roading, I always really worry about how it's going to do um, for my back. Because I've, I've actually been in one of the vehicles that we bought where afterwards at the Eastern Jeep Safari, I couldn't walk for two days because it, you know, crushed my back that badly. Uh, and so this, I love this thing, the LR3, I think uh, that's in a way the sweet spot. We don't know about the LR4 yet. It hasn't been long, around long enough, but I think the LR3 is a sweet spot. It's not as off-road capable as the LR2 or the LR1, right? The, Disco you know, 2. Disco 2 or the Disco 1. I mean, it's the same thing. Just, they just named the two different no, things. No, LR2 was I, the... I, 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 <laughs> Disco 2, LR2, it's the same. I know, I know what you're saying. Anyway, right? I... I <laughs> It's just silly. Anyway, uh, it's the sweet spot. I love it. Uh, it's it's ultimately comfortable. It's more of an overlander than a rock crawler, but yeah, that's it's, fine. It's not as good off road as no. a Discovery Two. Um, you know, it definitely struggles a little bit more. I think it's just heavier. It's bigger. It doesn't articulate as well. Uh, air suspension is a big common issue on those. Ours is still running the original airbags from two thousand and six. Yeah, but a new pump. Yeah, new new compressor. Granted, the previous owner did that, but everything works on it. And even in its highest suspension setting, the articulation is pretty good because they cross-link the air suspension, right? So um, not a bad rock crawler, just not as good as the Discovery 2. Uh, so other SUVs we've owned. Yes. 2008 Land Cruiser. Um, very expensive for what you get. So 150,000 miles, we paid twenty six grand for it. And it was one of the cheapest in the country. 200 yeah. Series, yeah. Yeah, it was a 200 Series, which is the current series. There's a new one coming. It's not out yet. Uh, and, of course, we turned that into the TRD Pro because Toyota doesn't make a TRD Pro Land Cruiser. So we decided to see if we can upgrade it and make it into what a factory would do as a TRD. And we did a lot to that one, right? We got an old man EMU lift. Uh, snorkel. Snorkel. Uh, wheels and tires. Wheels, TRD wheels. Uh, a wrap to make it, you know, that, that really bright white. That the rock TRD, rails. Rock rails yeah. from um, one of our uh, partners. Um, and, um, you know... I think, bar none, the Land Cruiser is the most reliable, the most solid, uh, the most um, proficient overlander you can buy, also the most boring. Yes, very good vehicle, but a little bit bland. So, yeah. you know, the, like the interior was very well made, but just not a lot of design to it. It was very dark. Uh, it, it just didn't drive that that it wasn't that much fun to drive, I should say. You know, it's just very heavy and kind of ponderous compared to like the LR3. Uh, infinitely better vehicle than the LR3. Uh, it'll go forever, but in, if you want kind of like a something to play with out in the sand and the dirt, not probably one I'd go for. All right, should we keep going? Yeah, you know, and I don't want to diss the Land Rover people out there or the Land Cruiser people. Yeah, uh, oh, because no. No, for you know, sure. they're very different vehicles. One is uh, just. Chock full of character, and you'll spend a lot of time getting to know it. And the other one <laughs> is chock full of re- reliability, uh, uh, but you won't spend a lot of time. So yeah, if if you if you had to take one around the world, I'd probably go for the Land Cruiser. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you just wanted one to play with, I'd definitely go for the Land Rover. Plus, it's six grand versus twenty six grand. Yeah, and there's a reason that's that. Yeah, that's for it. sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, one of the things that a lot of you guys out there seem to love watching and listening about, Jeeps. So we've owned quite a number of Jeeps over the years. And the first one we bought was a 95 Wrangler YJ. So this was my uh, high school and college vehicle. It replaced a Mini, actually. And this is kind of the, the first vehicle that, that started the, the route towards our enthusiasm for Wranglers and Cherokees and whatever. Great vehicle. Uh, people hate the square headlights, but super reliable. Four liter straight six. Uh, we had the three speed automatic in ours, and just a lot of fun. I mean, most fun per dollar in the Jeep world. You know, um, Mark Allen, the, the lead designer for Jeeps, says that's the 
vehicle that saved Jeep because, or at least a Wrangler, because before then you had the CJs and they were like very much like the older vehicles we talked about, right? Half tractors, half off roaders. Uh, this was the first one that had a wider wheelbase. You could actually take it on road. Uh, you could drive it at highway speeds comfortably. It wasn't so loud that you couldn't listen to the radio. Ours had actually the aftermarket or factory installed air conditioning, which is kind of an afterthought, but it worked. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it had those square gauges, which were really retro cool. Um, and, you know, when you look at one on Craigslist, they have a lot of miles. People say Jeeps aren't reliable, but you will be hard-pressed to find a YJ that's under 150,000 miles, and it'll be running strong because that 4-liter is, oh, gosh, one of the top 10 best straight six or just engines of any kind ever put in a vehicle. It's just ultimate reli- reliable, uh, powerful, comfortable, um, not fuel efficient necessarily, but, um, yeah, it'll just run till till you won't. Uh, and same thing can be said about the next Jeep, uh, 2001 Wrangler TJ. We bought this one as our cheap Jeep series. Tiny little engine, 2.5 liter four cylinder. Going down the highway, we had that thing wound up to like 6,000 RPM for 12 yeah. hours straight once. Could not kill it. You know, great engine. Even though they're a little slow, uh, the four cylinders were awesome. The TJ was kind of like a more comfortable, more refined YJ, right? Yeah, so it, they, they, they put in coils on it. And, it's uh, the most lovable. It's the golden retriever of the uh, yeah, J series. I agree. Uh, we drove it straight from L.A. to Denver over 1,000 miles through a snowstorm <laughs> uh, with a hard top, uh, and it didn't miss a beat. Uh, and we actually uh, fixed it up ourselves, so we did a lot of the work on that one ourselves, right? We uh, kind of uh, lifted it, put bigger tires on it, uh, did the usual things, and made it look into a, made it look really cool. Yeah, the great thing about the four cylinder Jeeps is if you want to avoid speeding tickets altogether, turn on the air conditioning, and you will not go more than fifty five. <laughs> so um, we had that one, and we also had the JK. Yep. So twenty sixteen Wrangler JK two door sport. Not the Rubicon, you know, not a really fancy one. Manual transmission. Uh, lifted that one as well. I really like that Jeep. 3.6 liter Pentastar V6. Plenty of power. Uh, you know, we, we could have gone for the four-door or the two-door. We specifically went for the two-door for that old-school feel. Uh, infinitely better in terms of everyday driving than, yeah, the, so, than the TJ. So let's go over, like, the last 30 years of Jeep. So it's, like, CJ... YJ, right? That's mm-hmm. the square, square headline headlight. one. Uh, TJ, which is a, the one that people consider the Labrador of Jeeps, a lovable one. Um, then you get into the JL, uh, which was the most modern one. Uh, JK. JK, which was the most modern one until the JL. Uh, and, you know, the changes are significant between those, right? You basically went from uh, a straight six to the ubiquitous Pentastar that's in most uh, Jeep Wranglers right now. And there was a couple of years of the 3.8, the, yeah. the dark years. Of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And, of course, the 4-liter uh, as well in those. Uh, but uh, what did you do to the JK? Because that's one that a lot of people probably uh, look upon now because it's becoming affordable. Um, that got the uh, Terraflex lift, 35-inch tires. Um, what did we have? Best top bumper on that. We had a best top soft top on that. Uh, worn winch. It was a great Jeep. You know, much different than the TJ. So the, the YJ and the TJ are pretty similar, both very small. Uh, JK got a lot wider, a lot more comfy. And then um, in 2012, they went from the 3.8 to the 3.6. So we had the 3.6 in ours. And then just a couple years ago, they went to the JL. And the JL kind of took the JK formula and expanded on it. So those are really luxurious. Yeah, the other thing they did with the JK is they took the uh, uh, interior and upgraded it like in 2011. 11, yeah, and made it more modern. So they upgraded the engine and they upgraded the interior. So if you're going to get a, a, a JK, go for the later years before the JL. Yeah, 2012 and newer. Yeah, if you want the nice interior and if, and you, the want the new, if you want the good engine. Um, but my only downside to that one was uh, that it was a manual, which, you know, is great. I love manuals, but off-roading, a manual can be a little bit more um, tricky to drive than an automatic, especially if you're doing, like, we did Top of the World with it, and you're on these really steep and really uh, jagged rocks, and you have to... Th- kind of feather the clutch to get it to engage because, you know, you're going to roll back. And it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of um, tricky driving, and you burn a lot of clutch. But it did it. Yeah, you know, of course. It did everything, you, even without the Rubicon package. The limited slip in that will, was great. Were you, that was yours for a long time. Were you sad to see that one go? Yeah, for sure. I love that Jeep. Um, and we replaced it with the Wrangler Rubicon Unlimited, Yeah, the white one. The JL. Yeah, didn't love that one very much. That one had the 2-liter in it. Great engine, just not a good Jeep engine. Yeah, so we wanted to see what the e-torque was because 
at that point, FCA had put eTorque, which is a 48-volt system that does things like allows you to use stop-start so that when you're at a stoplight, uh, you don't have to run the engine. So it's a way of increasing fuel efficiency. And then uh, they took their kind of ubiquitous 2-liter uh, turbo from their European partners and put it into the Jeep. And when I first drove it uh, at the launch, I was really impressed by how quick and torquey it was. Um, but then when we bought it, uh, we had some issues. Yeah, we did. We had a lot of charging issues with it. Um, you know, we had that issue with the, the, the charge light left that almost stranded, left us stranded, stranded at 14,000 yeah. feet. That was not great. Uh, the other thing, too, is, like, it, it's very hard to drive smooth. So, like, the turbo kicks in immediately, uh, and it kicks in hard, and it's just they, – they could have programmed it a little differently for the throttle response to come in more gradually. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you want a hot rod, the thing goes like heck. It sounds I, like a sewing machine. It sounds super weird. Yeah, I think if our – there's three engine choices now in the current Wrangler. There's that 2-liter. There's, of course, the 3.6-liter Pentastar, and now there's the diesel. If I had the money, I'd probably go for the diesel if I didn't care about payload. Uh, it just is the torquiest. It's the one that – uh, you'll never. What, what people end up doing with Jeeps is, of course, they personalize them like a Harley, right? They make them their own. And inevitably, if you go with bigger wheels and tires uh, and then bigger axles, you're going to run out of horsepower and torque. Uh, and you'll never have that issue with um, the diesel. Uh, and that's a thing that we learned along the way, right? So when you buy a Rubicon, uh, you're paying more, but you're getting things like Dana 44s, which are really strong axles. Um, you're getting things like um, lockers, dis- lockers, disconnectable sway bar, and so you can. Your JK was a sport, right? right. And which didn't have any of that. Well, I was looking, and so the sports, I bought it because we didn't need it at the yeah, time. Right. Uh, I was looking into adding a rear air locker, yeah. and it was like. <laughs> With insulation, it was like five or six thousand dollars just for the rear, not even the front. Yeah, and so you're spending a lot for Rubicon. But if you were to actually want to do that, like if you buy a Sport and then you want to add, you know, Dana 44s or bigger axles, or you want to add an ARB air locker, it's going to cost you so much more than just getting the Rubicon. Um, so I think that's why people end up often getting the Rubicon, paying more, and then they have that stuff without having to add it on later. And we were just looking at it. Was it a JK that yellow one that we were looking that at? That was a JL. Yeah, it was on, on 40s. It was, it was on the 40s. It was a sport. And I was like, oh, my God, uh, how how do you roll those 40s with that little Pentastar? Yeah, but, I, you know, I disagree. If I had to buy a new Wrangler, I would go for the Pentastar all day long. And you because, just did. Yeah, because it's, well, it's proven. You know, it's proven. We'll get to that in a sec. Yeah, it's proven. It's been around for a long time now. It's, but it's not. It's, it's kind of old. You know, I, w- I wish that they would. Who cares? It's a Wrangler. Like, they're direct injected, you know. No. D- you know, no, it's a Wrangler. You, you can still keep the same 3.6, but you can add modern technology that would make it more fuel efficient. And it would probably be better than adding an a, a EcoBoost, which is neither Eco or Boost. I was just talking to an engine rebuild expert. I'm sorry, not EcoBoost. Uh, E-Torque, which yeah. is neither <laughs> E-efficient or Torque. EcoBoost. I'm, I'm over at Ford now. Sorry, guys. I was just uh, talking to a jeep engine rebuilder yeah uh this is what he does he rebuilds engines yeah. he says the three sixes are awesome he says he's, he's seen them with super high mileage on them his, his sister's got one 200k I know. I know but it's the same engine in the journey Come who cares on. it works it's fine it's powerful <laughs> charger challenger you need more, it's in every no, product if you need more than 285 horsepower in a wrangler you're doing something wrong that's what i'm going with i'm just saying it's like it's like i got the same engine that's in my you know friend's journey um it's so <laughs> We'll keep going down the Jeep list here. Okay. I had a Jeep Cherokee for a while, 1991. Yep. I bought it as an off-road project. It turned out to be way too nice to take off-road. Really cool. It had the, um, what was it called, the upcountry package with the skid plates. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But it um, had some mystery leak that caused the interior to smell moldy all the time. And it was in just pristine condition. So I ended up selling that and bring a trailer just because I people were like, you can't touch it, you can't modify it, it's too nice, except for the leak. Um, and, uh, yeah, but Cherokees are great. Hard to keep cool at high elevations in the summer because they cram that 4-liter into them. But if you want an affordable off-roader that you can modify, XJs are the way to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the forerunner of the Jeep world. Or forerunner is the um, – or the Cherokee is the – you know, uh, I'm, you can flip it around either way. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, probably the most ubiquitous, um, affordable way to get into jeeping. Uh, it doesn't have lockers from the factory, so you, no. You, but but, but they're but, so cheap to add on those. I mean, yeah, like a, like a lunchbox locker. It's but it, fine. It, you, it, at least here in Colorado, in Moab as well, if you're out there on the trail, you will always see someone that has just taken uh, an XJ and lifted it and cut it and. Um, 
you know, done as much to it as inexpensively as possible. It's probably the cheapest way to get it. And, and they are going up. I think they've built over 2 million of them, but they are really becoming hard to find now if you want clean ones. Uh, and they were very reliable. Uh, you know, there's, there's like some vehicles that are just right, right? The, the, you look at them and it's like it's just the right size shoebox for, for a lot of different shoes. Uh, and uh, for a long time, for 20 years, that was the one. The new version of that, I think, is the current um, Grand Cherokee. That, mm-hmm. You know, it's a little bit bigger, but it's for our times, it's just right. What about the current Cherokee? Uh, it's a little too small, I think. I think it's become. I think we've gotten used to having bigger cars. Uh, and as, if you're, uh, let's say, a young couple or a single person, then a Cherokee is great. But if you've got a family, it just doesn't have enough room in the back for everything, whereas a Grand Cherokee does. And let's face it, the two aren't that far apart in price. I mean, a Cherokee will start to become as expensive now more than a base Grand Cherokee. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Okay, should we move on? Yeah. Um, so we have a, uh, a category here I'm calling weird stuff. Okay. Just kind of quirky off-roaders we've owned. You mean like a Suzuki Samurai? No, that was a, that was a really old stuff. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so this is a weird stuff. 2001 Pontiac Aztec. Um, <sighs> we, we bought this one for $1,500 just to do kind of like a joke series on. I loved it. I really did like the Aztec. Uh, huge amounts of space for the outside of the vehicle. Interesting interiors with the cooler as a center armrest. A quirky styling. A and tent? Yeah, we got a tent. tent. Yeah, we got the tent on it. And the Versatrack all-wheel drive system was super advanced for the day. So it used high hydraulic fluid on uh, a set of clutch packs in the rear to distribute torque left and right. So pretty cool stuff. Yeah, so I think, once again, that was a car um, that started out as a truck and then got turned into a car because GM did some cost-cutting. We know Tom... Peters, who also designed the Corvette and the current or the last gen Silverado, did that one. And if you look at the original design sketches, it was really kind of badass looking. And then, you know, the accountants got to it and it became a car. But it had a lot of really unique and interesting um, aspects to it, right? So ours had air suspension in the back. It had had uh, that pump. It had, it had a rear air pump, pump for so tires. You, so you could air down or air up. Yep, really it had, cool. It had, a, it had a tent that went on the back. It had a cooler for the armor. So you, I mean, it, just a, it had a heads-up display, just all this pr- stuff. But, you know, people thought that it was ugly, which it probably was, uh, and it never got past that. So, you know, it became a mommy mobile. People never really took it off-road seriously. We did. It did okay. Yeah, it did okay. It was a little old and worn out. Ours had, like, Kuhner K, so the clutch packs were less than happy. But... Um, you, you, having said that, if you want an affordable and somewhat well-made um, SUV to get you where you need to go with a lot of stuff, the Aztec is actually not a bad bad deal. Um, next up on our list, 2004 Touareg. Yeah, that's uh, on the entire list, that's probably my favorite vehicle uh, just because it's such an underappreciated and such an over-engineered off-roader. Uh, people love our Tough T-Series, and rightfully so. I mean, that vehicle is... You know, 95% of a Wrangler uh, that can go on the Autobahn at 120 miles all day long. Uh, you know, the Wrangler, for its most of its life, came with one, maybe two engine choices. Uh, the Touareg, especially that first gen, I think had something like five or six, en- everything from diesel to a V8 to a six-cylinder. And, and the diesel was a V10, oh my God. Uh, low-speed transfer case, air suspension, rear locker, um, and uh, all the fun stuff that uh, VW could stuff into a Phaeton, uh, then got put into the Touareg. Just uh, Volkswagen's moonshot, incredibly complex, incredibly capable. If you find a good one that's been taken care of, buy it. Um, if they have been taken care of, it's a money pit. Yeah, for sure. We have water-cooled alternators and crazy stuff like that. Also, same thing, you can plug into the air suspension to fill up tires. It's it's very easy to do a great off-road vehicle, and it's somewhat easy to do a great on-road vehicle, but putting the two into one are just about impossible. And the Touareg, I think, is one of only a couple of vehicles in the entire world that's and, able to and, do that. And you've got to only go for the first gen, for the most part, because that's the only one that has a low-speed transfer case. Because uh, uh, The second gens did, too. Did they, uh, the T2s, I, yeah. But not T- in the Porsches. The, no, the, the it, was sure? a, it was a facelift. So what they did is they're, they're, they're called T-Series, so T1, and then T2 was just a facelifted. Uh, T1. Same thing with the Cayenne. So the first gen Cayenne and the facelifted Cayenne both have the low speed. Right. But then the, then the true second generation. And then the full redo, yeah, yeah, the T3, which came out in 2011. Which we also have. 2011, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's the next car on the list, 2012 Cayenne. Yeah. So the Cayenne and the Touareg are co developed together. Yep. And the, the third gen 
Turag and Second Gen Cayenne um, use the same platform. They lost the low speed transfer case, um, but they're still good. So the, the Cayenne we have still has air suspension. It still has an off-road mode. We have the really rare one with the rear locking diff. You could get them with an off-road package with skid plates. So interesting vehicle. Not sure I'd want to take it off-road long term. I'm not sure it'll it'll hold up to it like the first gen uh, Touareg would. But still very capable. Yeah, I love that car as well. Uh, but you can tell that, um, you know, that in the Volkswagen, it has this incredible, at least the first gen, right, this incredible bandwidth where they said, we're going to make a great Autobahn burner at the same time, we're going to make a great off-roader. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's hard to do. The only other German company that's even come close to that is maybe Mercedes with the, with the AMG uh, uh, G wagon, right? That's the only one that may be that 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 much of a broad bandwidth. But but with the Porsche, you could see that they kept the off road worthiness, but they concentrated on like track usability uh, and then on road worthiness. So while it can go off road, it's not as happy as a Touareg. It's not as happy as a Touareg, no. it, but it's incredible capable. It'll still do it. Uh, but then because it's a Porsche, you're terrified of damaging it. Um, whereas with the you know the Porsche costs us twenty three thousand dollars, the Touareg costs us four thousand dollars, and if there's one thing that determines how good an off-roader is off-road, it's how much you paid for it. It's yeah. that simple. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Because that's as far as you're going to push it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, next up on our list, 99 ML, Mercedes ML, a car no one thinks of as an off-roader. First-generation ML were pretty cool. Fully independent suspension, but body on frame. So no, no modern it's a truck. SUVs. It's a truck, basically. Yeah, almost no modern luxury SUVs are body on frame. And then a low-speed transfer case as well. Um, so what that means, you push a button. It has a special programming for the traction control system, which will then distribute torque where it needs to go, called 4ETS. It works pretty well. It's not as cool as a Touareg because it can't lift itself up here in the U.S. We never got the air suspension ones. But very durable. So these cars got the reputation as the Alabama trash can because yeah. the interior quality was pretty crap. They were built in Alabama. Yeah, and they were built in Alabama. But if you're willing to push them, they will hold up to it because the actual bones of it are super tough. They are really strongly made, yeah. and they're dirt simple. Yeah, the upside to an ML is, you know, it's very simple to fix and upgrade. Uh, it's very uh, basic for Mercedes, which is great off-roading. Uh, but it looks like you're taking the kids to the play date. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not a very attractive design, the first chance, I agree. <laughs> However... If, and if your play date happens to be off-road, then why not? If you want to buy one, it's almost cheaper than walking. Because yeah. you can get a first-gen ML for like 1500 or two grand. Yeah, and they're pretty solid. Yeah, they're pretty easy to fix, too. Really they're like simple. the Cherokees of the uh, Mercedes. Yeah, they're like the world. Cherokees of the Mercedes one. Except nobody does that with them, because they look like, you know... People will figure it out eventually. Yeah. People will figure it out, yeah. But, yeah. And you can get the AMG. There was the ML... Yeah, design. yeah. That's problematic, though, because... Because it was lowered. No, it's fine. It was lowered. It had bigger. Same, br- it had bigger brakes, and you can't. Same put body and frame, low range. You can you figure. Can, it you out. can't put bigger wheels and Just tires swap on, on it. brakes from a three twenty. <laughs> yeah, you got to swap brakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the last one on our weird stuff is a car we recently just purchased, seventy eight Subaru DL. <laughs> I know, I know, you're laughing at it, but they're really good off road because they have a proper four wheel drive so, system. So, let's talk about the. Kind of the history of four-wheel drive and all-wheel driving cars, right? The very first all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive car was a Jensen Interceptor. Yeah, we're talking car. Car, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But the second one, I think, was that Subaru DL. At that time, it was the first mass-produced. Yeah, at that time, it, it was car. the only vehicle I think you could buy that was four-wheel drive because it is four-wheel drive and all-wheel drive, where you didn't have to go out and actually lock the hubs. Yes, car it was. So car, the yeah. the Wagoneer. From Jeep also had that, right. but that was huge and sucked more fuel than the Arab Emirates had. And it was before the AMC, because people are going to be like, hey, what yeah, about the AMC? Yeah, it was. It did beat the Eagle yeah. by several years. Yeah. yeah, so the way it works is front-wheel drive yeah. all the time yep. until you pull a lever, yep. and then you engage the rear axle. But when you do that, it works really well because it's only about 1,900 pounds. It has skid plates on it, four recovery hooks. Good stuff. These are these are good. They, they rust away if you breathe on them, but... Um, I think the most important thing you said there, it was only 1,900 pounds, right? And the, the difference between, like, Formula One technology and race car technology and off-road technology is the same, right? The less weight, 
the better the vehicle. And people forget about that when they go off-road. They think that, you know, just because I throw on some massive wheels and tires and huge bumpers, that it doesn't matter. But that car proves that, you know, lightweight off-roading is incredible. And what really proves that are side-by-sides. Because, yep. you know... You, exactly. You, That's why they're so good, because yeah. they're so small and light. Yep. Yeah. Power-to-weight ratio is incredible. And those Supers are tiny. So let's quickly... Zip through the list of newer trucks we've owned. Trucks. Sorry, Andre. This will be on TFL uh, Talking Trucks, our other podcast. And if you like this podcast, you got to check out TFL Talking Trucks because uh, that one is uh, really, really good. Really good, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so the first long-termer we bought was a 2014 F-150 Raptor, and you loved that one. Yeah, I think for a long time that was the favorite truck uh, I ever owned. Uh, you know, I, I really had a hard time when the Raptor went to the EcoBoost uh Twin turbo six cylinder. Uh, I, I just think trucks, especially full size trucks and V8s, uh, go together. You know, like I keep saying peanut butter and jelly, but I'm trying to find a better analogy. Any ideas? Um, Put you on the peanut spot butter there. and ham. No, that doesn't go together. <laughs> <laughs> um, lawnmowers and grass. Hawaii, Hawaii, and um, surfing. Weed killer and weeds. No. I have to cut the grass today, so I'm thinking a lot about cutting grass. All right. Uh, anyway, um, love that truck. We put 57,000 miles on it. Uh, it was almost bulletproof. Um, um, it was, uh, you know, the first high-performance uh, desert-running truck you could buy commercially. From the factory, yeah. And 10 years later, it's still the only <laughs> high-performance desert-running truck. The closest you can get is a Jeep Gladiator Mojave, but even that doesn't have the same um, now active suspension. So um, highly recommended. And they're getting affordable now. Those first-gen Raptors, you can get those for under you know 30 k We bought it for 54 and we traded it in and got like 40 Three? Yeah, yeah, it held its value incredibly. Um, okay, so after the Raptor, we had the Ram Rebel, the 1500. Yeah. 19, uh, that we lifted with Terraflex components, put mm-hmm. 35s on it. Looked really cool. Put some, put some performance parts on it from yeah, Mopar. Yeah, Mopar. Looked very cool, sounded very cool. Wasn't so good off-road. Um, yeah. It just didn't articulate very well, and um, you know it struggled a little bit when the going got really tough. It wasn't purpose built like the Raptor. Yeah, you can kind of tell like the Raptor was just engineered from the ground up to be off road worthy. This the was Rebel a is more truck. like yeah, that. That was let's do a great full size truck, and also it can go off road. Yeah, I just never fell in love with that truck, and I don't know why. When Andre put that Mopar exhaust, it sounded incredible. Uh, the stickers made it look cooler. Uh, you know, it just we just really it had that sports bar on the back, and the lights were incredible. But I just never connected with it, and I, I'm, to this day, I don't know why I connected with the Raptor, but not with that truck. Sometimes, you know, it's just not your cup of tea. Okay, so Rebel went away. We don't have the Rebel anymore. Right. But here are the three trucks we do currently have: three off-roady trucks, yep. right? Uh, Silverado Trail Bus. Yeah, we just Four. drove that to get here. I love that truck. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. We just took it off-road in, in Moab. And it's basically a Rebel, right? It's the same thing. Same it's thing. basic lift. It's it's not engineered to be a off-road truck. It's engineered to be an on-road truck that happens to go off-road. G80 in the rear, so yeah. I would much prefer a button to engage yes, your locker. Yes. But uh, I just like it. I like the look of it. Maybe I'm just a sucker for the looks. Yeah, it's, it's a good-looking truck. It's a good-looking really truck. It's a good-looking truck. It's yeah. also got a lot of clearance, great tires on it for the factory. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's it's very basic in some ways. It is. We, we got we got the V eight, of course. You know the five three, not the six two. Yep, it's does everything. It tows quite a bit, ninety five hundred pounds yeah. more it's, than the Raptor, and it's very fuel efficient. Well, more than 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 I think the Raptor you had. That was yeah. like what eight. That was the problem with the Raptor. You know, I think we were averaging. If I got fourteen. Um, oh, between, yeah, that was a big issue. Yeah, if I got 14 MPG between tank fills, I was happy. And that, that, that hurt because not only was it expensive, but I felt like I was you know, burning through a lot of valuable oil that you could be being used to make plastic or you know, whatever you do oil for that, that you don't burn. So uh, speaking of 14 MPG, uh, we have a 20, uh, 2020 F250 yep. with the new 7.3. Love that truck. FX4. Love that truck. XLT. Yeah, that's cool too. Once again, basic. I don't need all the yep, bells and whistles. Uh, that one is getting. It's in California right now. It's getting uh, upgraded suspension, so it's uh, well, full Carly. It's going to be really Carly, cool. We've Carly. got a huge plan. Andre's got some big plans with that. So Carly suspension and, a, and an RV camper. Yeah, it's getting a um, uh, like a uh, full four, bed mounted camper four wheeler. Yep, uh, that's going to be really cool. And then that's going to go up against our 2020 Gladiator. Yep. Jeep Gladiator. Which, so, which you just finished upgrading. So what did you do with it yesterday? Yeah, really cool stuff. So this was a Rubicon. Yep. Um, and we worked with Mopar, Warren, and BFG yep. to really turn it into something cool. So it's got a uh, two-inch suspension lift, 
steel bumper with a worn winch in the front, um, full LEDs on the light bar and the A-pillar, uh, snorkel, <laughs> the Jeep Performance Part snorkel, a deck to bed system, and then BFG came with three 35-inch tires on steel wheels. So it's got this really cool military look on it. Uh, just a Gobi color. Yeah, super excited about how it came out. So we're going to have a lot of content on the... Uh, and the coolest thing about that, you can upgrade to 35s and you can still put it underneath the bed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you yeah, don't, so you don't have, you're not struggling with like, now what do I do with a spare tire? Because if you're going off-road, you want a spare tire. Yeah, matching spare. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be a problem with uh, uh, the Ford because we have no place to put the spare now. Andre went big. He's going 37s on that F-250. He should. Yeah. Well, it's an F-250. It's a huge truck. Yeah, yeah we, wanted to get the, um, we wanted to get the Tremor, but we needed, for tax reasons, to buy it last year. Yeah, um, and it was too is, new. You couldn't find any of them. Which is ironic now. <laughs> we were worried about tax savings now that COVID hit, of course. We got the exact opposite problem. Funny how the world's changed so quickly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be a really cool... Uh, Comparison. So we're, we're, we're upgrading the Jeep and the F-250. Yep. To kind of compare big versus little off-road, if you want to go long-term camping, overlanding, okay. what's a better option? And the plan is we're going to drive it from... Georgia all the way to Portland off-road this year. Cross-country, yeah, Cross country. all on dirt. That's the plan. Yeah. So huge project this summer. Yeah. They take the two of them, and we've got a roof nest on the Gladiator that's coming. Yep. Um, compared to a bed-mounted camper in the F-250. Dude, that F-250 is going to get like 8 miles per gallon. It's I, I, be, I can't it's wait. Gonna it's going to be like, so it's bad. It's like overlanding, you know, the European, Australian, South African way, right? And Ooh, overlanding the American way, oh, where you where you take your shower with you, and it's not one of those that hangs outside where you have to you know have freezing cold water, but you have your full on oh, kitchen and bathroom inside the uh, camper. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and hopefully we can get that accomplished. That's still on track. Uh, we've been working really hard to make this happen, given you know how hard it's been to actually uh, travel and get stuff done now. Well, so there you have it, guys. There is our complete list of vehicles we've owned, the off-roaders we've owned. There's a few on-roaders that we can do another video around if, if this is something that interests you. And thank you so much for listening and oh, watching. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not done yet. We're not done. What are we missing? We, we're missing the most important question that we have to ask, okay? Oh. Which was your most favorite and which was your least favorite? So let's start, and I'll tell you mine. Okay. All right, so which was your most favorite of those? Uh, well, well, you just got to pick one. Favorite? Yeah. Yeah, you can only pick one. Probably the Touareg. That's yeah. probably my most favorite. And then least favorite was probably the uh, JL, the Rubicon. I did not like that one very much. Why didn't you like the JL? I just, I really didn't like that two liter. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it kind of left us stranded at some bad times. A great Jeep, but it just did, it didn't connect with it for the price that you pay. All right. How about truck wise? You've just picked two cars. Oh, well, my most favorite truck for sure is the gladiator okay i really love the gladiator. i agree the gladiator is is really cool uh but i'd have a hard i i i don't know i want to see the f250 see how that turns out so it's going to be a toss-up between those two how about least favorite truck it's hard though those trucks are really good um yeah i don't really have a least favorite i don't have a least favorite on that either okay I, what's your main what's your most favorite on the list um if i if i had a i mean i just saw that jeep that we did or you did i probably picked that it just looks so badass no, no, no car Oh, car. Most favorite car. Definitely the Touareg, um, just because it's such a um, unheralded, uh, you know, uh, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of the underdog, and I love underdogs. Uh, what was your least favorite car? Or yeah, least favorite car. The one that hurt me the most was by far the Suzuki. Just it, 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 the short wheelbase, uh, just <laughs> and, and and of course the JK. Didn't not that it was I didn't like it, but what happened was we were running uh, fins and things the back end of it, and there was a cattle grate, uh, and we had how much of a lift was it? That was no lift at the time. That was, there was, was no lift. Stock suspension. No yeah, it lift came off the that cattle grate. It was it like three foot grade. drop. Three foot drop, and it hit the frame. Yeah, and that that impact went right into my back. Uh, and I was at my favorite time of the year, at my <laughs> favorite event of the year, which was the Easter Jeep Safari. And we were doing it before Easter Jeep, so we hadn't had a chance to go and actually look at the uh, concepts. We didn't have a chance to go on the trail run. We didn't have a chance to go to the garage. I uh, didn't have a chance to, and, and I basically spent it in my hotel room because I couldn't walk. Yep, that was no good. So, I, so it, it's just that, that reflection of the truck, it's a reflection of the, I mean, of the Jeep, it's a reflection of the experience I had with it, but I can't separate the two. What was your favorite truck? On that list, like I, like I said, the, I'd have a hard time picking between the uh, 
I think you like the Raptor the most. You really love that truck. I did love the Raptor, yeah. So out of the old ones, I'd say the Raptor by far. I was That was one that, that um, uh, you know, if I live long enough, I'll go back and get it again. <laughs> I'll, right. find, I'll find one like 10, 15 years from now that's pristine and hopefully blue and, and go, go get it again, even though now would be a good time to get it. Yep. All right, there you have it. Yep. Thank you guys for... Um, Spending another, what, almost uh, 45 minutes with us talking about off-roaders and off-roading. Uh, if you're interested in watching any of the videos, because we've done video series around all these vehicles, you'll find them on tflcar.com or on our YouTube channel, of course, tfltruck.com or our YouTube channel. Uh, and if you're interested in that uh, Transamerica project that we're doing, that's coming hopefully this summer. Uh, so um, if you want to get a sneak peek... Uh, Help become a Patreon supporter oh, for sure, of, yeah. of, of TFL, and we've been posting behind-the-scenes videos to those guys so they actually can see what that uh, uh, upgraded Jeep Gladiator looks like. It's badass. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.